Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Urban American, The Wickoff Group. <laughs> So there are these things called restaurants in New York. There are these iconic restaurants, and then there are these iconic operators. Some of them are operators, definitely operators, and some are even chefs. So today, I have assembled, with the help of my executive producer, Drew Naporent, four of the leading restaurateurs of the world. My guests are the legendary Buzzy O'Keefe. Buzzy is the man for the River Cafe in Brooklyn, uh, the Manhattan Water Club, and, needless to say, Pershing Square. The legendary boy from Brooklyn. The City University, City Tech, New York yeah. City Tech. Yeah. The man who was at the 21, who was at the Windows in the World, of the Porterhouse in New York, Michael LaMonaco. Now, there's only one Four Seasons. Everybody from around the world wants to come to New York to be at the Four Seasons restaurant. And I have the co-owner of the Four Seasons, Julian Nicolini. And last but not least, the fame drew Naporent of many restaurants. You know, Michael, we've been together for many shows, but I would say this group of people in the you restaurant business. You tell everybody business, that story every time. <laughs> no, I, the, the, this one I'm most <laughs> excited about, and, and because uh, three individuals have, have either owned or worked in New York's greatest restaurants. I mean, Michael, of course, at the 21 Club, Windows on the World, I started in my first restaurant was Le Cirque, the original Le Cirque. Le Cirque. Yeah. Wow. I, I don't know how to work a little. See, but Julian, he, but, but he looks so good for his age, but he's owned the Four Seasons for many years. And Buzzy, this is actually your second life because I, you look better now than when I knew you 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Uh, Business is good for you, Buzz. But Buzzy, you know, how has it changed in the restaurants over the years? I mean, how do you see operating a restaurant today as you compare to do you know when you opened up in Brooklyn years ago? Well, <clears throat> Brooklyn was my ninth place, but w when I first ninth opened place? up, y y you walk through clouds of smoke when I was in rooms on 50th Street. I mean, everybody was smoking. In fact, the other night, I was late night, I saw I'm going through the channels, and I, there's a film where the doctors are smoking, and the patient is in bed with a cigar, <laughs> and everybody's smoking. I went back, and the film came out in so 1955. So, so is it helping the restaurant business? So 68, people are smoking? 69, and 70. I mean, it was, it was, the nightlife was different. The nightlife stopped with... Uh, so was it easier to operate a restaurant then? It or? was, it was, um, no, it was, it's always difficult to operate a restaurant. You, you're still dealing with the people. You're still dealing with the food. You're dealing with the employees, getting talented employees to be nice. And the proven the thing, chefs. 
Oh, oh yes. I mean, that's. <laughs> I, I mean, and, and, and why you, did he point at me? I, <laughs> and, that's key, and, but, wait, but. And you've had prima donna chefs, but some great chefs. I mean, you, your places have been like the training ground of some of the top chefs in the world. I mean, they've, True. And, they, and they've said it, and they all, you know, even well, David. It, it, takes a, it takes a really confident operator, I think, to really take on really talented chefs, and Buzzy had a, I, I'm speaking, I don't mean to speak for you, but he had an image, a vision, I should say, and he created, he really was at the forefront of creating part of the chef culture that we see today. I mean, Absolutely. I, Absolutely. And, and none really. were known when they came. They were all unknown, so people said, I, don't hire him. He's, He's a nobody, and I'd say, and I'd go out, for instance, with Charlie Palmer, and I, you know, he's a country boy, you know, I'd go out and some of my staff was saying, <clears throat> nah, he's not the guy for us, you know, and they said, you're making a mistake, this is the guy for us, I said. You know, I'd go out to dinner several times with Charlie, and, and I hired him. I mean, he came to see us, but, uh, and then, obviously, you can see people like David Burke pretty, <laughs> pretty, Readily, I mean, his talent just burst yeah, all over the place. And, little, and Foygione, you know, I mean, Foygione is, uh, was uh, very talented. And he came through a, a friend of mine who was a lady pastry chef, an unknown lady, but an Amelin Bien, who was a people. A you know, this, great re this, this chef. really relates to you and to Julian. I mean, you've been open in Brooklyn since 1977, right? 77, yes. A and then you opened up in the Water Club. What? Water Club, uh, 82. 82. I mean, how do you keep people coming back to, to these institutions year after year? And people want to come to your places. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, some places are easier. Um, I mean, I was fortunate at the River Cafe because we were next to the Brooklyn Bridge, which is, you know, an icon of America, never mind New York. And then it looks out on the skyline and the Statue of Liberty's on your left and the Empire State Building's on your right and you're on the water, so um, people come. Like tonight, half the people will be from Europe. David Willentis owes you, because when I did his life story on Building New York, which unfortunately I did his life story, which we we're deleting in the files. Uh, Boring. Okay, David said that when he took the ride to the River Cafe, that's when he decided to buy Dumbo. He was right over there because he saw the River Cafe and he had the vision that something's over there. And Michael and I, since we're Brooklyn boys, we knew that Brooklyn. Julian, how does the Four Seasons is open? How many years now? Uh, the Four Seasons has been open since uh, July 20, 1959. Right, you had your 50th celebration. Uh, yeah, a couple of years ago. And basically, the way we are constantly rejuvenating ourselves is very simple. And also, it's very, very easy for us because, you know, the restaurant's name is Four Seasons. We're able to change the menu every season. We're able to reinvent ourselves basically every season. Unfortunately, we're no longer able to change the furniture every season, like at the very beginning of the, n the early 1959 and so on. Uh, they were able to change the color of the chairs, the color of the banquet. I mean, they were really out there. Is, is that for the landmark law? No, no, no. I mean, we, we couldn't afford it today like okay, today. You cannot change yeah. chairs all the time. You cannot change banquettes all the time and so on. But basically, because of the fact that we're able to constantly change the menu, uh, change the uniform, change the trees and so on. So every time that a customer comes over... And we should scream at season. Alan because huh? Alan took, changed his name from Park Avenue Cafe to Park uh, Avenue yeah, Seasons. Think, think about that. Park Avenue Seasons and so on. But again, you know, just like the River Cafe and so on, I mean, uh, the, I don't think there is any other restaurant in New York City that is, is, it is as... Uh, a quintessential restaurant like the Four Seasons. It's a beautiful building, number one. I mean, you're, it's located in the Seagram Building, one of the best buildings in New York City. Then the Four Seasons restaurant was designed by Philip Johnson. It's another plus. And it's like, a, basically, it's like a museum. The but it's a, isn't yes. the Four Seasons like a club also? I mean, well, you, you, I, in certain aspects, you have certain regulars who are always there, who, who want to come there each day, you of know, course. for lunch and for dinner. They have their certain table. Of course. I mean, we're very lucky in that respect. I mean, we really treat our clientele with, with the utmost respect. We provide them with the best possible food. We provide them with the best service as well. But the most important thing about the Four Seasons is basically it's the interior itself. It's like... It's not really like a regular restaurant because it's a landmark. The, the restaurant inside is so beautiful. We constantly have brand new art, which is very important. There is a, there is a Picasso in between the two dining room, between the grill room and the pool room and so on. And it's really spectacular. I mean, you know, I would like to tell you that uh, the only reason why I'm at the Four Seasons, one day I went there for dinner, and like in 1977. And, uh, and, it was, and it was so, uh, I was so taken aback by this incredible beauty. 
you know, and I decided the following day to call up one of the owners and said, I would like to know whether if there is any possibility for me to work in the Four Seasons restaurant. And yes, there was, and uh, I've, I've been there ever since. Yeah, the, the in, yeah. it's probably the, the greatest and the most simple restaurant concept yeah. ever conceptualized. Because it, it is a beautiful, I've been going there since I've been yeah, of 19. Course. But if you figure in but 1959, beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. When, when they conceptualized, Joe Baum conceptualized the idea of seasonality as yeah. it applies to food, as it applies to culture and art. And, and think about it, every day, nowadays, everybody's copying it. Right, but and, and exactly right, exactly. exactly right. But you can look at a menu from mm -hmm. the 60s at the Four Seasons and see fiddlehead ferns and yeah. products that- Periwinkle. Uh, Periwinkle, <laughs> that, that, products that are you know sort of cutting edge products. But the point I was gonna make is um, uh, even a, a glorious space is just a shell without the hospitality. And he and his partner, Alex Von Bitter, have, have provided an unbelievably vigilant level of hospitality. So not th that that is a very difficult client. It's basically we all have consistency, yes. His is the most difficult. Yeah. But they go there now uh, probably equally for the food, the place, and them. And that's a very rare thing. But, uh, but, but the most that, important that thing persona about Personality is really key. You know, yes. you're, you're a chef, you're an owner. Important. No, no, but, yeah. but people, but people want important. the personality. They want that comfort. You know, people knowing you, the, the, the you know, it, it has a unique great consistency. Uh, uniqueness. But well, it has to have, an, every restaurant needs an identity. It really yeah. needs an you identity. Think this generation, though, um, is, is plays into what Michael's talking about. There seems to be a level of a anonymous dining where restaurants on the cutting edge today don't even check your coat. They don't even take your reservation. And quite frankly, they don't even honor your reservation if they take your reservation. Our level of what we tried to achieve, and we did, we changed the restaurant business. We changed the hospitality. It was dominated by the French restaurants. Buzzy yeah. is the, is you know, he, he created the whole American genre. But basically, I mean, beside yourself, I mean, the Four Seasons restaurant was, was one of the only restaurants after the French that was really yes. totally innovative, yes. in like in 1970. In 1970, the Four Seasons restaurants, as you well know, the first start to go into totally American cuisine, totally American yes. food. Yes. I mean, that was like Four the first time ever. The, the most important yeah. restaurant to, to uh, showcase American the wines? Wines, of course. We were also the first restaurant in America to showcase not only the American wines, but we were the first one to, um, to have the so-called California barrel tasting. And the California barrel tasting lasted for about 10 years. So that means that everybody from California, all the selected vineyard, they would come to showcase their wine at the Four Seasons restaurant once a year. And that was like the most sought after ticket in, in town. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was. Whether it was Mondavi, whether it was the well, Berenger. Well, the barrel tasting. Yeah, the barrel legendary. tasting was the Barrel tasting yeah, was that legendary. Way, and, you the, know, you, and the kind of food that we and were it got serving. So yeah. And the only reason you stopped it because it got too large. It got so large and so, so also because people were trying to copy it again. So once you, be, once you see that people are copying yourself, I mean, you have to start doing something else. You can't just well, I guess doing it. I guess really the point is is that every, you know, every periodically uh, uh, an industry changes or any industry changes through uh, through a certain period of time. And the Four Seasons was at the forefront, and and then in the seventies, I mean, Buzzy, with it was a vision to open the River Cafe. You know, we were talking in American this dining. About, uh, you know, we were talking about Alan Stillman when he opened up Smith and Walensky, uh, and, and they basically had three Italian restaurant, three steakhouses that were around. There was Chris Sella, there was the Palm, and then he came out. You know, over there. Uh, Steak has become big. I mean, but you you you've kept a great name with the steakhouse as a, as opposed to some of these other people. Well, we uh, we we take a different. And you're approach. in a, and you're in a vertical situation, which never really worked in New York City. I mean, there was never a place in New York City where you would have a restaurant right. on the fourth floor of a facility. I mean, it's a unique facility, but it's still vertical. Uh, well, I have to. Give, I really have to give credit to uh, to my partner Ken Himmel for that because his vision of having, he called it, and he still called, they call it the restaurant collection at, at the Time Warner Center. You know, it was, it was a risk for the reasons that you say, it hadn't been accepted before to have dining on the third floor, the fourth floor, but he really uh, put together a collection between Per Se and Massa that really kind of anchored, you know, and every, every good retail situation needs anchors, but restaurants have always been at the forefront of anchoring a neighborhood, a block, a street. But, but you, know, you always but, see but that. that really and Buzzy is an example of anchoring, I mean, really. You're talking about anchoring, you're talking about Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge, and you're talking about, right. about Manhattan Water. But at the same time, think about Nobu. 
Wasn't that like the first restaurant on the, on, well, on the well, lower west side? Well, well, no, the, I mean, Montreux. Oh, Montreux. Oh, Montreux. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, please, but, please but, don't but, make him yeah. feel bad. But, was but they're all children. I mean, you know, Montrachet was 25 exactly. years ago, 26 <laughs> actually. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, out of Montrachet came Tribeca Grill. And of course, Nobu okay. came out of the Tribeca Grill. Um, you know, so all my Tribeca restaurants, and you're right, uh, as committed to our individual neighborhoods, you know, I took a, a, a shot at Tribeca from a real estate standpoint. Why? Because I could afford the rent. I couldn't afford the rent where you are. I, I looked at real estate, and I probably didn't the, want to go to Brooklyn. The, the bright urban planners throughout America know now that restaurants can bring back and create a neighborhood, save a neighborhood. Whether you went started down in Soho, the Upper East Side with uh, Fridays when it started in 66, uh, all, all the restaurants popping up in, in Soho. And then, the, I mean, and look, then they're going look down to the Tribeca and Williamsburg. I mean, the, the, the I mean, all these, the, the they all come back the from meat packing district cafes is, and restaurants. is an example. I mean, I did a show three weeks ago in the meatpacking district, the rents. I mean, they're trying vertical right now because they can't afford to be on the first floor of a facility in the meatpacking Well, that, that's well, the shame of, of what happens. Right. We go into neighborhoods. Right. <laughs> and then we gentrify then we the neighborhood in a good way. And then, and then we get priced out ourselves, really. And we get priced out ourselves. But I'm going through a real estate negotiation. Now, I've been in this, the premise for 15 years, and, and a guy, guy looks at me like, like I, I haven't paid him rent. You know, I, I paid over $2 million in rent in the 15 years, and it's, it's an amazing we, thing. We took a different approach also because uh, we realized that, you know, what you referred to a moment ago about the, the sort of the steakhouse is kind of an oversold segment of the restaurant uh, dining, and we, we really... Even though we were called an American steakhouse, but we really opened as an American grill. And I'll tell that's you exactly right. that You're I had a grill. You're an American grill. And because we have a very broad menu. And in fact, um, you know, we appeal to a, a, a broader demographic and we appeal to more appetites, more different How appetites. many, you know, because we have, you know, we have places here that people want to go from around the world. Would you say 50% of your customers are New Yorkers and 50% are out-of-towners? Um, you know, actually, I know that uh, probably no more than 15% of our guests are from outside of uh, New York City. What about you, um, Buzz? We're in the fourth. Brooklyn would be considered the fourth largest city in America. I think so, uh, somewhere. It is. It, but if, if it were. Especially when if, I have Marty Markowitz on if, the show. If, if it were. <laughs> say, Marty would certainly say that. And uh, uh, a small percentage of our customers from Brooklyn, a small percentage. And, you know, surprisingly, there are many extremely wealthy people who don't leave Brooklyn. I mean, they, they live in Brooklyn. They go all over the world, but they're very wealthy. So, but, uh, but, uh, well, most well, of our, I think what I said, Michael was really most talking of us, about New Yorkers. Yeah, That's most not, of, well, 85% of my guests are, are New Yorkers. Yeah, but here's the story. It 50%. used to be if you 50 said for your restaurant was tourist-driven, even Mayor Bloomberg the other day, when he was saying, why do we need Tavern on the Green anymore, threw out that it's tourist driven. Meanwhile, we call them visitors now, and we love them. 47 yeah. points. And we look down our nose you know at something? them. We're visitors. 40, They're visitors. 40, we love them. 47.3 million visitors last year helped the, right. the, helped the, the hospitality, the oh, it helped the restaurant the business. It helped the a lot theater, of people. The, no the theater. Sure. But nowadays, you know, think about the pre-theater business and so on. Nowadays, you know, they really people do not spread out as much as they used to do before because you have so many restaurants, right, wow. in the same district where you have the theater district. So they, they don't really go far away too well, much. I right? understand the, the yeah. travel trade because uh, I was for four years the executive chef of Windows on the World, and that was really a that was travel driven operation. But that was a People spectacular came from all over the world. And they announced yeah, yesterday, that. Michael, you saw it, they announced they, that they're not, they're they're killing. But why is that? Is that, a, is that because the, the cost under the union I, idea would be too great? Because I, I, I it was the largest grossing restaurant in America. I'm not Windows disagreeing, but I think part of the circumstance over there, and you did bring it up, and you know, it's a, a, an item that I always like to bring up. You take the combination of the union, you take the combination of the rent over there on, the, on that s side of the floor, you know, it's prohibitive. You know, well, how I, many I, terms are you going to have over there? Well, the thing I think is prohibited, just talking about the, like, the business, is uh, the prohibitive thing about the World Trade Center, the new World Trade Center, if they were to do a restaurant, I think is the build-out. Because it's a large space, and at building cost, I mean, this is not 10,000. I mean, my restaurant, Porterhouse, is 10,000 square feet, even a little less. 
but that would be a 50,000 square foot operation. And the, your, I, your build, the build out, out is your build out cost would probably be 65 million dollars uh, conservatively. For that for that place, and if they uh, tried to replicate you know, uh, the Four Seasons, oh, the Four Seasons, yeah, 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 yeah. probably about conservatively, million at dollars. least sixty-five million dollars. Right. I mean, when the so you really have to do a lot of business, and, and the bigger problem today, as opposed to nine eleven, is nine eleven. You know, after the first situation, it was difficult getting up. Today, you won't get up. The 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 ability to get up to a restaurant in that high, high security level? building like that would yeah. be rather... That's really quiet. one of the biggest problems yeah, that, that we're facing. There's no question about it. But going back to what kind of clientele we have at the Four Seasons restaurant, yes, of course, during the day we have approximately 85% the Local. regular customer. In the evening, of course, we have visitors. Of course, we have people from all around the world. And also, as far as, you know, this country as well, don't forget. Mm -hmm. and uh, But I think one of the most important things that we should look for is that we have to constantly provide the same service, whether it's you have the 85% New Yorker or the other people you, as well. You, you it's know, very you important. Because an interesting point. I was talking to a friend this morning, and he had dinner at a place called Canaletto. And my, my joke is, hey, these Italian restaurants are in Italian. Mm -hmm. They're Croatians. He could get away with saying that. <coughs> what he was said Croatian. Did, he got, he got, got a little... Okay, okay. So, so, what, so what happened is <laughs> his restaurant he had dinner last night had a C, <laughs> had a C rating. Yeah. Oh, God. Half the restaurant was empty. Well. Wow. What you, the, the, the three fellows who are sitting here, I'll tell you what they <laughs> really excel in. And what they really excel in is hospitality. And I. Even him? I, and especially, <laughs> especially Drew. Hospitality is, I think, a the hallmark. From the head. It's a hallmark of the restaurants that the Four Seasons. Uh, the River Cafe and, and, and uh, you know, I, I just think, and Drew's myriad restaurants, hospitality was what I grew up in the business thinking was the first and foremost. So whether you're hospitable to but, but, uh, locals uh, or tourists, okay, but, it's all uh, the same. Think, or people you know who are is? diners are guests. Okay, here, They're our guests. What you're we never saying, call them customers. You don't have a guy no, here no, who would but, call but them but a what customer. what you're saying, and you see Julian or you see Alex, always in the restaurant. They see you in your restaurant. You see Buzzy at the restaurants. Him, I don't know what he is, but I, I move sometimes around. he moves see. around. You know, he's like a shooting target. But they see somebody who's there, who's a regular with it. And you know, it's the real key to, to that maitre d'. He makes maitre you feel good. He does. There's right. no question about it. Think about it when you want to entertain somebody that is very important. You go to the Four Seasons restaurant. I mean, if it's your regular restaurant, there's no question about it. You, you go to, your <laughs> to the Four Seasons restaurant, you feel extremely comfortable. You, you request whichever seat you want to have, they'll give it to you, we'll give it to you. You request whichever, you know, captain or waiter you want. And at the end of the day, when you're about to leave, instead of paying the check, we'll just get the check and mail to your office or your house account. So that is service. But this That's is what people a are dying, looking but for. But this is what you're just saying. It's an experience. I pick up, right? well, I pick up my reservation sheets from all the restaurants. Yeah. They're on something called Open Table. Mm -hmm. It'll tell you if they booked over the phone or if yes. they told you if they booked online. We have to say one of my restaurants with the most expensive prices. So, well, some days, not one person calls to make the reservation. Yep. Correct. This is mind-boggling to me because he knows yep. not one of his customers, on the level that yep. his customers are, would ever book the reservation online. Why? Because they want him to know that they're coming in for lunch and don't hose us. Make sure we have a nice table and look after yeah. us. That's hospitality. The, this online thing, this social media, you know, like it's talking about how it's all going to help us. I'm actually worried that we lose the relationship that we have with the customer yeah. even before they set foot in our establishment. And this new generation is very, you, you know, you, don't I, talk I, to I, me. I don't want to, you know. Very the, interesting the, thing. About a year thing. ago, and I have a lot of young people on my show. A guy came over here. He says, I've seen you had these restaurant shows. I'm in this business where we're getting 30 to 50% off. Could you introduce me to your friend Drew? Yeah, I said, I'm not going to. I said, I'm not going to do it. He says, but uh, he says, uh, you know, some of the finest restaurants are using us. I said, fine, go to this, those people. Uh, you, and you bring up an important point. You know, this restaurant.com, the, the Blackboard, the other things over Blackboard here. Blackboard Eats, Tipper, you know, Groupon. One of, one of, uh, but I think one of, the very important, one of the very important <coughs> reasons here we're talking about why people are using, let's say, they're using Open Table to make a reservation, because in the middle of the night, you're getting up and you want to go somewhere. I mean, like two or three days after. Right. And so you just go on Open Table and you make a reservation, whatever you want. And it's a really a tremendous service. I think it is a particular. tremendous service, yet at a restaurant on the level of what we're trying to put forth.
Mm -hmm. it, 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 it actually takes away one of our most important tools, well, uh, which is talking to the well, guests. Personal contact, personal, personal relations. You know, because of course. It, you know, <clears throat> yeah. I'm, a, I'm right to, to, to in, say that uh, you know, your yeah. lunch customers are not booking online. Of course not. Maybe they it might, we don't, we don't, no, they we don't have the grill room online, by the way. But, but you know, <laughs> right? yes. I, yeah. I bet you touch yeah. tables, right? Of course. During a meal, you'll touch a table means to to go and recognize somebody and say, hello, thanks for coming, glad you're oh, here. Oh, we do it to, to do it. almost all, all right. of our customers. Not only greeting at the door, but yeah. sometime during the you meal. You know something? Uh, that I, personal I had, contact. I had Alan Stillman on the show part and of the his life, and then they sent me a card for his uh, situation, you know, his restaurants, and he has this telephone number that you call, and yeah. they give you the restaurant. A special it's telephone number. Special telephone yeah. 10 minutes later. I mean, it's unusual that he has certain seats always available, but I mean, that's it's a personality of the restaurant business. That I get more reservation on my phone than... Uh, yes. No, 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 but okay. listen to this. I swear so, to God when I tell you this. This is the truth. When I call the restaurant okay. today because I had to make a special mm -hmm. occasion reservation, uh, would you mind holding? Okay, I'm holding now for three minutes. Now, that's the reason why you would book online because you don't want to be on hold. Right. But yeah. this one was even better. The same restaurant I had called earlier in the day and they said, oh, the person you're asking for is not here. Um, would you like to leave a message? I say, yeah, my name is Drew. Uh, hold on, I don't have a pen. <laughs> so in other words, they're taking the reservations <laughs> online. They don't have. They can't even write they, down. You, that's right. They don't. And they're making. You follow me. With, with this group of <laughs> with this group of four <laughs> operators, individuals, I need another half an hour to do the show. <laughs> and I promise to bring them back in a couple of weeks, maybe. And I'd like to thank Buzzy, Michael, Julian, and Drew. See you next week. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns, and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Urban American, The Wickoff Group.